Uh, good morning, Broadway. Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer and we'll get started. Father, thank you for this day that you have given us to come into your house and worship you. We pray, Heavenly Father, that your spirit would just fall upon us and it would uh, open our hearts and our minds to your truth and your guidance and your love and your hope and your joy. Allow us to just uh, forget about the things that are outside of these walls uh, for the next uh, 30, 45 minutes and just uh, focus on you, hear you, speak to us this day. We thank you, Heavenly Father, most for your Son, Christ Jesus. His death and resurrection uh, saved us from life uh, spent eternally without you. So I praise you and thank you. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. So, uh, over the last couple of weeks, we've been uh, giving you some tools uh, to, to deal with evangelism. And evangelism, basically, short definition is sharing the good news of Jesus Christ with other people. A lot of times, uh, I have conversations with folks about sharing Jesus with other people, and they say they don't know how. Uh, and so, uh, Doug started with one verse evangelism, which came out of Romans chapter 6, verse 23. That's one good methodology, if you will. Uh, Mark preached last week on the acrostic gospel and how you can share uh, the way, the truth, and the life, God's love, and God's life, or, and Jesus is the light. Uh, this week we're going to look at an example called the bridge. And, uh, but the thing I want to express to you is that the most important thing when it comes to evangelism is your own testimony. You can do a lot of things, you can have a lot of scriptures, you can have a lot of verses, you can go through all of those kinds of things, but if you don't have a personal testimony that you can share with them, you're missing one of the most valuable parts of the tool that you have available to you. Because the beauty about your own personal testimony is nobody can refute it. It is what it is. You have experienced, you have walked that path, you have seen the Lord work in your life in the ways that He has worked in your life, and they cannot say it isn't true. Because if you think about the Scripture, when it comes down to it, it takes about as much faith as it does to believe in evolution as it does to believe in God. And so, when you boil it down to that walking on the bottom line, you have nothing other than to say, I just believe, but the question becomes, why do you believe? And that's when your own personal testimony becomes absolutely critical. That's when you can share the good news of what Jesus not only did to the world, but what he's been doing for you. So when you think about evangelism or sharing Jesus to the world, make sure that you've put together and thought about your own personal testimony. Make sure that you've looked back at the past and seeing how Jesus has just worked through the power of the Spirit in your life and how he's put pieces in place to put you where he wants you to be at the time he wants you to be there, speaking the words that he wants you to speak, all of it just being orchestrated by the God who loves you. So in all of these three examples, the most critical part's going to be, are you willing to share your own testimony? So as we start with the bridge, I want you to understand your testimony becomes first. You have to know that first. And if you don't know it, in, in a Jobs for Life class that we teach, one of the things we teach them is to have a 30-second commercial. And basically that is to sell themselves in 30 seconds. They need to tell an employer who they are and what they bring to the table in 30 seconds. So you need to have a 30-second testimony about what Jesus has done in your life so that you can use that as a starter to share with somebody and start to talk to them about Jesus. He's, he's not a mystical concept. He's up close and he's personal. And this is how I know because I've seen him operate in my own life. So if we're turning your Bibles, if you don't mind, to 1 Peter 2.9. It says this, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people. You have been chosen. That's critical for us to understand. We have been chosen to do what he asked us to do. 
And it goes on to say that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into the marvelous light. That is your personal testimony. What he's telling us to do in that scripture is to proclaim, shout it at the top of your lungs what Jesus has done in your life. That's what he's telling us. Reading the same verse uh, from NIV, or not NIV, but from the New Living Translation, it's, uh, it uses a little different word. I can find it here. Come on. It's always nice when the fingers aren't working. Well, somebody got the uh, NLT and got First Peter looked up already for me. There we go. First Peter 2, 9 says this. But you are not like that, for you are a chosen people. You are a royal priest a holy nation, God's own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God, for he called you out of the darkness into his wonderful light. And that version of it, it talks about we are to show the world who Jesus is. In other words, we are to live a life that shows the world who Jesus is. So not only are we proclaiming what Jesus has done in our life, we are living a life that shows the world who Jesus is. And when it comes to evangelism, those are the two most important tools that you bring to the table. A life that is being lived the way that Jesus asked you to live life and your own personal testimony. So make sure you have both of those before you go out and start evangelizing. But if we look at the bridge, basically, if you want to put that up there, this is the bridge analysis or the bridge model, if you will. And it talks about, at the very top of it, you'll see God's purpose. What is God's purpose for humans? Why did he create us? And what does he want for us to experience in this life? Well, in John 10.10, 10, it tells us that he, we want, he wants us to have a full and abundant life. How do we do that? We do it with Him. We do it by being a part of who He is and the way He created us and the plan that He has for us. Jeremiah 29, 11 tells us that he, he has a plan for us and that plan is to prosper us and not for disaster. It is a good plan and it's a plan for hope. So God has a plan for us and that's God's purpose for us. It isn't for, in a lot of cases, what we live out today because we don't even focus on who God is. But that's what God's plan for us is, is to have a full and abundant life. In John 3.16, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whomsoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And that's the key point to the whole thing. He wants us to have everlasting life. You know, everybody that is born is going to live forever. The question is whether you're going to have everlasting life or everlasting death. And what is the difference between the two? Everlasting life means you spend it with God and Christ and the Holy Spirit in heaven. And everlasting death means you spend it separated from them for eternity. And so God's plan for us is to spend eternity with him. So that's God's plan. That's what he wants to do. That's the purpose that he has for us. But then we get to our problem. Everybody knows what our problem is, right? The easiest term is a three-letter word called sin. But the reality of our problem is, is that we are separated from God. That's our problem. Because of our sin, we are separated from God. And there is no way that we can change that. And that's the critical problem that we have. We can't change it. And up there you'll see verses like Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23, Doug talked about that in his one verse evangelism. Same thing, all have sinned, fallen short of the glory of God. We have sinned and we are no longer connected with the Father. 
when Adam was in the garden, when Adam and Eve were in the garden and they sinned, God moved them out of the garden. They were no longer connected with the Father. And there's nothing that we can do about it. I can't work my way into heaven. I can't cry my way into heaven. I can't beg my way into heaven. I can do nothing to get there. So in essence, if I'm living this life and I don't know Jesus, then I am dead. Even though I may be breathing and my heart may be pounding, in terms of God's view of the world, I'm dead because I'm not connected to him. But God had a plan for that. And it's God's remedy. And we all know that that's Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was sitting up there with God, living life large. And God turned to him and said, we got a mess down there. Can you go down there and fix it? And Jesus said, yep, I'll go down there and fix it. So Jesus came into this world because he loved us and he cared for us and he died for us. In Ephesians chapter 2, it talks about this whole relationship that we have with Christ Jesus and what this remedy looks like. And it says this, God saved. What does he mean when he saved us? He restored that relationship through Jesus Christ. So it says God saved you by his grace when you believed, believed in Christ Jesus. And you cannot take credit for this for it is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for good things we have done. So none of us can boast about it goes back again. Our greatest problem is a problem that we can't solve. And that's what Ephesians tells us. Our only solution to the problem is God's solution to the problem. And that's Jesus Christ. Jesus is the answer. He's the only hope that we have. And so, as we talk about evangelism, we go out into the world and we share Jesus with people. That's who we are. That's what we've call, been called to do. We haven't been called to come into church every Sunday morning and sing a few songs and hear some guy preach a sermon and then go home and do nothing with it. We've been called to go into the world and share the good news of Jesus Christ. For most of us in this room, that's exactly what happened. Somebody shared the good news of Jesus Christ with us. We believed, and that's what comes next, which is our response to the good news about Jesus Christ. So you look up there, and it starts with John 1.12. And John 1.12 says, believe that Jesus is who he says he is that he is the Son of God, that he came into this world to solve our biggest problem, separation from the Father. So step number one in our response is to believe. Step number two comes out of Romans 10, 9 and 10. We must confess and repent. What does that look like? Confessing basically says to God that we'll admit to the fact that there is nothing that we can do to restore our relationship with him except through the blood of Jesus. I confess that I have no ability to get there from here. And then I repent of the things that have separated me from him. And it goes on to say that results in I have eternal life. There is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Comes out of Romans chapter 8. When I accept him, and then the last response that I have comes out of Acts chapter 2, verse 38. If you have your word, you can turn there. My last response is going to be this. Peter replied, each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sin. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So my last response as a non-believer accepting Christ as my Lord and Savior is to be baptized. So if there's somebody in here today who does not know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, the first thing I must do is believe that Jesus is who he says he is. I must repent of my sins. I must turn from my wicked ways, confess those sins to the Father, and be baptized. That's why every Sunday morning we offer that opportunity for you to come forward and make that public confession of faith. 
When I was baptized, when I was uh, 17 years old, I walked right down that aisle and stood right there. And Marshall Leggett took my public confession of faith where I broadcast to the world that I believed that Jesus was the Son of the living God. And then he took me right back through there and I went right up there into that water and I was baptized. That's my response to what he did for me. So why are we talking about this evangelism thing? Why have we spent three weeks talking about evangelism? Well, the number one thing is, is because that's our job. Most of us don't understand that, and it took many years before I realized that that was my job. I professed to be a Christian for a long time before I realized that my job, being a Christian, was to share Jesus with the rest of the world. Not to come in here on Sunday morning. And so as, a, as the body of believers that worship here, we need to go into the world and share the good news. And so now, there are no excuses that say, I don't know how to do that. Because over the last three weeks, we've given you three tools to do that with. And now it's a matter of the heart. And I'm going to show a video. And when I told the staff I was going to show a video, they all about had a heart attack because... It's not something that I really like to do when I teach. But this video hits at the heart of this issue that we're talking about and have talked about over the last three weeks. So just pay attention to what's going on in the video and then I'll come back and have a response. It was really wonderful. I believe he knew that I was an atheist. But he was not uh, defensive, and he looked me right in the eyes. And he was truly complimentary. It wasn't in any way, it didn't seem like empty flattery. He was really kind and nice and sane and looked me in the eyes and talked to me and then gave me this Bible. And I've always said, you know, that I, I don't respect people who don't proselytize. I don't respect that at all. If you believe that there's a heaven and hell and people could be going to hell or not getting eternal life or whatever, and you think that, uh, well, it's not really worth telling them this because it would make it socially awkward. And atheists who think that people shouldn't proselytize, just leave me alone, keep your religion to yourself. Uh, how much do you have to hate somebody to not proselytize? How much do you have to hate somebody to believe that everlasting life is possible and not tell them that? I mean, if I believed beyond a shadow of a doubt that a truck was coming at you and you didn't believe it, that, that truck was bearing down on you, there's a certain point where I tackle you. And this is more important than that. And I've always thought that, and I've written about that, and I've thought of it conceptually. This guy was a really good guy. He was polite and honest and sane, and he cared enough about me to proselytize and give me a, a Bible, which had written in it a little note to me, uh, not very personal, but just, you know, like your show and so on, and then like five phone numbers for him and an email address if I wanted to get in touch. Now, I know there's no God, and one polite person living his life right doesn't change that. Uh, but I'll tell you, he was a very, very, very good man. And uh, that's really important. And with that kind of goodness, uh, it's okay to have that deep of a disagreement. I still think that religion does a lot of bad stuff, but man, that was a good man who gave me that book. That's all I wanted to say. That's Penn Jillette, a Penn and Teller. A comedian and magician. He's a very world-renowned atheist. He's written many books about that fact. But there's two points that I want to make out of that video that I think hit home for us. 
And the first one is probably the one that everybody got, which he said in there, how much must you hate somebody if you know the truth and you're not willing to share it with them? Think about our daily walk. How much do we hate the people that we walk by every day? Because we know the truth, right? We know the truth. We know, as he said, there is no God. We know absolutely that there is a God. And that God sent Jesus into this world to save us from ourselves. We know that as a fact. How much do we hate somebody if we're not willing to share that with them? Would you be willing to save somebody from getting hit from a truck? Would you tackle them and get them out of the way? Absolutely, every one of us would do that more than likely, right? And in the big scheme of things, it doesn't really matter. The thing that matters the most is where are you going to spend eternity? And our job as believers, as those who know unequivocally that there is a God, is to go tell others about that God. But the second thing, and this is one of the issues that a lot of folks have when it comes to doing evangelism, is they wonder if it worked. Well, first thing I'm going to tell you is it's sort of, uh, uh, it doesn't matter whether it worked. Understand me. It's like leading a horse to water. I can lead a horse to water, but what can I make him do? I can't make him drink. But what is my responsibility? To lead the horse to the water. It is my responsibility as a believer in Jesus Christ to go into the world and share Jesus with the world. What happens after that is not my responsibility. That falls into the hands of God. And I'm glad it does because he's far more powerful than I am. He has far more tools than I have available to him to use whatever it is that I put on the table when I speak to somebody about Jesus than I do. And the question in that video was, Duh, did this man handling, handing Penn Jillette a Bible have any effect on Penn Jillette? He did, because I'll tell you this. If you know anything about his writings, if you've ever heard him talk about Christians, he believes that we're all idiots. We're insane. We're stupid. We have no character whatsoever. That's what he believes about Christians. And what did he say about that Christian who gave him a Bible? He was a good man. Can God use that in that man's life? to bring him to the saving grace knowledge of Jesus Christ? Absolutely. Because as we've studied about evangelism and we studied about how all of this works, you got to plant the seed and then you got to water it. And that's what happened here. The seed was planted and now God's watering it. That guy may not ever be around to see what happened with that seed. But the young man who took the Bible to him was there to share the good news of Jesus with him. A renowned atheist spent most of his life talking down about believers. But at the end of it, he said he was a good man. So our challenge as, as his children is not just to think about our walk with Jesus as coming here on Sunday morning. But our challenge as his children is to go out in the world and share Jesus with everybody that God asks us to speak to. In the mornings when you get up, ask God to put somebody in your life today that you can share Jesus with. Last thir this last Thursday, I finished a class at North Point, the state penitentiary. And at the end of it, we were just sort of sitting around talking about the class. And one of the guys asked me, he said, why do you come down here? <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Thank you so much. What a wonderful invitation to talk about what Jesus has done in my life, 
to share with him why I come down there because Jesus has given me so much of a blessing in my own life and now he's asking me to return that and I do that here with you. He's got hundreds of thousands of people out there who don't know Jesus. Millions who don't know Jesus. And it starts one person at a time. One conversation at a time. One person who's willing to share the good news of Jesus Christ. And then allow the Holy Spirit to do His thing. And you're here because somebody did that for you. You're here because somebody shared the good news of Jesus Christ. And then the Holy Spirit did His thing. Let's thank Him for first having a plan to save us from our own destruction. That plan being Jesus. And if there's anybody in here today who doesn't know Jesus and wants to come forward, who believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, you're more than welcome. When Spencer and the praise team come back, you're more than welcome to come down and make that public confession of faith. Confess, repent, and be baptized in His name. Let us pray. Father, holy, 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 You are. We praise You and thank You. Ah, You're so awesome. I thank You for Your Son, Christ Jesus, and the gift of life that He gives to us. I thank You for your spirit that dwells in us, that speaks to us, that guides us, directs us, leads us, speaks through us into the lives and the hearts and the minds of all people. Give us the courage to step forward, Heavenly Father, and go into this world this week and proclaim and live a life that shouts Jesus. Thank you for your Son, Christ Jesus, and it's His name I do pray.